thank you for coming. I, I wasn't expecting so many people because yeah, I'm the last one, so it's not it's not so easy to yeah, to be here after all that uh, great food and stuff. So, thank you. <laughs> um, yeah, let's start with the simple stuff. My name is so my name is Fischer Mitoyo, Valentin, and I work for the University of Vienna. Um, more specifically, I'm working in a group called Domainis, and we have one single scope to manage the name servers for the .at registry, the databases, and yeah, all the systems which are uh, behind it. So I'm just a monitoring guy, a sysadmin. Um, yeah, I work daily with Logstash, Isinga, Elasticsearch, and lately with big data systems also. And yeah, we will see why, because yeah, we have all these tools. Well, the scope of this presentation is yeah, like a walkthrough for starting to monitor stuff with Logstash. Uh, there was another presentation about Logstash. I haven't managed to take part in it, but yeah. Um, and describing possible integration of Logstash in big data environments. So can we use Logstash with these big data systems, NoSQL systems, and yeah, uh, how? So just some simple stuff. Uh, we'll, I think a couple of people here also use Logstash. How many of you are using Logstash? Okay, nice. Uh, and the rest of you ever heard about Logstash? No, okay, not so many people, okay. So yeah, it's uh, mainly it's a software that allows you to send, receive, play with logs, and also um, by using this ELK uh, stack, which people use all this, all this time, so you have a complete solution in managing logs. And this is quite cool. It's getting a lot of interest because of this uh, friendliness in configuring it, and it's quite easy, for me at least. Um, I think it's the same as Puppet and other systems which use this abstractization layer, and I think it's quite okay. It's based on Java. Uh, it works as an agent and daemon, so yeah, you have to use Java, but there's also some trend to yeah, make the dependency on Java less, less uh, difficult. Okay, uh, how do we use it? Yeah, we started by testing it, and the idea was to see uh, what... Uh, Java is yeah, but you also have Java in it, and so... No, it's JRuby. It's, it's JRuby, of course. <laughs> but True, but the overlayer which is using is Java. So, yeah, any, so any comment, and any, if I'm uh, saying any stuff which is not correct, yeah, just... Uh, yeah, just correct me. So we started to see what logs we can manage with it. The, the idea was to be able to manage our DNS data, uh, Postgres, Postgres data, SOAP and so on, because we are using Isinga. But um, we had no, no specific solution in order to manage the logs. So um, yeah, we started to look at it, and yeah, we are not using Splunk, so yeah, we started to look at, at Logstash. We are now using it in production, and we are actually feeding uh, logs from multiple sources. So we try to cover as much as possible. Uh, okay, why? Uh, why do we want to use it? Because, yeah, it seems that it's um, quite powerful in, in allowing you to mangle with logs and uh, process them and display them in a thousand ways. And we also want to, to cover the whole monitoring spectrum. So we wanted to connect Isinga to Logstash. And uh, yeah, we, we tried to monitor also the states, but also the events which are happening. Because yeah, this is not so easy, at least for us. And yeah, how, how do you deploy it? Well, it's quite simple. Uh, I think the challenging part is in generating a configuration which which allows you to get only the useful stuff because it's easy to get all those logs, but it's more uh, difficult to 
get only the specific stuff that you actually want to keep. Um, in most cases, people recommend to use this centralized setup. This, meaning, uh, this means having a shipper, a queue, an indexer, and some storage. You could actually skip some parts, so you can skip having the queue. You can just, yeah, you just have a shipper and a storage, so it all depends on your case, so yeah. This is an overview of the centralized set, uh, setup. This is actually uh, taken from the Logstash website. And yeah, this is just an example on how you could use it. So yeah, you have those shippers, which are actually agents. You have a broker, which is the queue, the indexer, which actually mangles the logs. So you do some processing on the logs. And then you uh, send it to a storage, which could be Elasticsearch. And you have the web interface, which is Kibana. So that's why people use this Elk uh, stack, which is yeah, composed of these ones. OK, how much harder do you need for it? This is not so easy to, to, to decide, because it all depends on the amount of data you process per day. So uh, if you process like 5 gigs, 10 gigs, you don't need such, a, such a strong hardware. You usually need um, large amounts of memory and CPU. So um, the idea would probably be um, start with something more and see how much usage you get. Then um, yeah, after you make your setup fine-tuned, yeah, you can uh, go, go down or go up, depending on yeah, how much uh, load you actually get. Um, OK, I, I was saying that you need, uh, you need this um, specific structure. So uh, the first step in order to work with Logstash would be uh, to define an input. So this is just a simple input. Uh, it's just using a file. It's using the plain codec. You define the path. Uh, you can define a starting position or not. And uh, you give a name to it. So this type is actually to identify the type of the input that you want to, lose, uh, to use later on. Um, after you have an input, you have a filter. So um, you have the input, you have the filter, then you have the output. So this filter is quite interesting. This is the most, the most interesting part, I think, in Logstash, because in this uh, part, you actually process the data and make it in a specific format, or you clean it, or you add some other data. And in this case, we use the Grok filter which is quite cool because you can use these um, patterns, which yeah, a lot of people are making patterns for Grok. And um, you can just avoid using regex and use these pre-made patterns, and you can match your data. If it's matching, in this case, it will add that tag, process tasks, and if not, it will just uh, have that failed task tag which you can see later on uh, in your interface, or you could even have conditionals in your configuration, and you could uh, drop messages based on it, or pre-process it again, or whatever. Yeah. And this is an output. So in this case, we're sending to Elasticsearch. This is just a cluster. Um, yeah, It's the same codec. You could, um, you could have any number of inputs. You could have any number of filters of outputs, so you don't have any limitation. There are a lot of inputs and outputs and filters which are now present on, on the site. And even if it's not uh, present, you can make it on your own. So you just need to know Ruby, and yeah, that's it. So nothing else. Um, working with, with Elasticsearch. Yeah. So having Logstash is usually uh, yeah, not enough. So you need this storage engine, and it's, it's much more because it also allows you to search, to search in it. So you have this Lucene language, which is quite cool because it gives you the power of uh, searching quite easily. And it's also a powerful storage system. So you can have clusters of storage systems. In our case, we have uh, five servers, and we store in them approximately 
five terabytes of data. So this is uh, for one month. So we keep the data only for one month. In our case, um, we decided if nobody cares about the data, um, if it's not looking at the data in one month, probably it's just not important enough. So, okay. And yeah, this is an overview of what you can have with, with Elasticsearch and what you can do. Yeah, uh, you have the collector, the web UI. Uh, the web UI actually, yeah, it's Kibana, which is connecting to the system and you fetch data. Um, for, for Elasticsearch, you can define roles for, for the nodes. You have the master's nodes, yeah, which are uh, controlling the other nodes present in the system. You can have a search load balancer because um, when you have, so the issue is that when you have large amounts of data, um, you usually generate a lot of load on the system because let's say you want to search in the last month. So if you have indexes which have like 20 gigs per day or 100 gigs per day, all that memory, uh, all that data is loaded into memory and tried to be, tried to be presented to the users. So this is getting an issue. And yeah, you can define specific roles in the servers in order to minimize this, this load. Um, and the last one in the stack is Kibana. So how I so, so I was saying that Kibana is yeah, just a web interface used to connect to Elasticsearch. This allows you this fancy view and the search language to use. And you can group them in dashboards. So like you had in, in Greylog 2, I was, I, 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 I was just saying uh, how nice it was. And uh, you can define dashboards for different actions or for different users. So in our case, we actually have like 10 dashboards which we use. We have one for DNS data. Uh, we have one for security. So we, in, in our case, we are, uh, we are using um, Logstash for security issues like tracking users which log in, which fail to log in, sudo requests, and yeah, uh, SSH uh, brute force attacks. So we just want to see that data. And also DNS data, we want to see for, for example, um, which zone is served by which name servers or which uh, client is served by which name servers. So yeah, we split the data in these multiple dashboards and we make layouts depending on the needs. So charts, histograms, trends, and so on. So this is how it looks. But uh, I was hearing that somebody was complaining about this um, white on black stuff, but this is not present anymore because you can change the the colors, so you can have it white on black or whatever. And how do you do an actual deployment? It's quite simple. Um, you just get a package, um, and we will actually go through each step. It's quite fast and simple. Set up a shipper, set up a queue, indexer, and storage. So what's a shipper for order? This was the stuff that I showed you at the, at the previous slides. It's actually an agent that contains some input, a listening port, file, etc. Uh, gets the data and sends it forward. In the Okay, so it's, this is just sti the simple stuff. So you just define the input and send it, then just send the data for the run. You can also do pre-processing. So if you want to pre-process the, the data in order to decrease the load on your uh, indexers, you can do it and yeah, it's your choice. Um, usually people ship logs with the far using the following uh, agents. Uh, but yeah, it's your choice. Uh, the first one seems to be the most, um, how should I say, um, most used because in special, in, in big setups at least, log 
courier seems to be light, and especially for machines which are from Amazon, because the load can be um, quite high sometimes because of the large amounts of data. So yeah, Logstash can also be an agent, so you can just use it as an agent and not do any processing, and so just fetch the data and send it on. Uh, Logstash forwarder, this is yeah another attempt to be more light, and yeah, this is actually uh, so log courier is a fork from Logstash forwarder, and yeah these two are quite nice and they're secure, so you can have certificates and send the data encrypted over network, so yeah, this is quite nice. Um, Enix log. Uh, from what I see, this is mainly used for Windows logs, so people use it mainly for Windows, which ship yeah, logs. And Beaver, this is also quite light and fast. Yeah, this is, uh, let's say, for the Python guys, especially. Um, and how do, sh uh, yeah, how, how do you set up this indexer? So you have a shipping agent which is sending data. Uh, this would probably be the receiving part. So this indexer is actually an agent, a uh, logstash agent, which contains some logic filters uh, that do some processing on the data and then um, yeah, pass it on to an output or send it back. So whatever you like. Um, in this case, you just need yeah, an input, a filter, and an output. So let's see how it actually looks. It's quite simple. So, so this is an actual indexer. In my case, I'm not receiving from any yeah, from any TCP port. I'm just looking at, the, at some files. I'm just looking at some JSON files and using the specific codec. Then I'm processing the files. I'm matching some timestamp and adding adding a tag. So I, in this case, I'm actually getting data from RIPE. It's from this um, DNS mon, which uh, which so we have a large number of probes over the globe, and we want to see. Yeah, who who requested access to the probes and at what time. Then we add some uh, GYP data in order to use it on a map. So we we map these probes on the map and we can see the clients and so on. And yeah, so in so we, we have the input, we have the filter, the date which is matching the timestamp, the GYP which is actually adding data so coordinates and so on the on the message itself. Then we do some mutate. We convert the coordinates to float, and we send the data to to the storage, which is Elastic. In this case, is it's a cluster. It's it's Elastic Search, and yeah, we uh, we don't have to use any specific node. So if you just have the cluster, it will be detected and over the network and it be, be sent okay. Okay, so, um, so yeah, um, in our case we were using a queue. Um, we were using the queue especially because we were sending large, um, a large number of messages and um, we were feeling safe with it and also to avoid any issues over network and so. So we were using Redis. We were uh, just defining, uh, defining queues for specific logs. So for um, DNS data, we were using a separate queue and so on in order to avoid any issues. Um, I think Redis and RabbitMQ are the most used queues. So, yeah. Depends on your preferences. They are well both supported. Um, and now the last part which you need to set up is the storage cluster. So you actually need some storage in order to keep all those logs. And yeah, in our case, at, at the beginning, it was Elasticsearch. Um, we, we'll, yeah, I think it's quite powerful, and I think it's. Um, it's uh, very, very interesting, especially because of its searching, uh, searching powers. So, yeah, 
the, the configuration was quite simple. You just edit some file and set the maximum limit for your RAM and the cluster name, and that's kind of it. The next part would be Kibana. Kibana is yeah that uh, web interface which you need in order to visualize the data. So uh, this is the one which is actually connecting to the storage cluster. Um, it's uh, quite powerful uh, because of that um, views and dashboards. And uh, the language which is used in it is this Lucene. Lucene is an Apache project, so uh, it's quite interesting. You can look up the syntax on, on apache.org. So yeah, it allows you this uh, nice uh, queries like uh, messages where yeah, log source equal shipper one and, sh and shipper two for this example, but you can have any any type of of queries. Uh, how do you debug? So this is uh, sometimes difficult because uh, when you have this large number of messages coming in, um, it's not so easy to find the source of the problem. Uh, but usually, you, when you want to debug something, in our case, we were sending to, to STD out and applying uh, Ruby on it. This, so it's a specific codec. And you get these nice formatted messages. And um, you, can, you can view more if, if you have specific uh, strings in the messages or some filter is, is dying or so. So you could have data which is messing up with your filters or inputs and so on. But yeah, to find out more, you can just enable the debug and uh, send to the STD out, and I think you you will be okay. If you really have issues, uh, you can go to IRC. Um, you can use the free node network, and I think that's the most active place because. A lot of people, and actually people which are developing Logstash are present there. So you can just ask for help, and I think it's quite useful. Um, if you need some, some specific filter or input or output which is not present on the website, although there are quite, quite many of them, um, you can just make your own. So if you know Ruby, I think it's quite simple. You have this specific structure, and then you you just add some some uh, custom code for your need, and I think you're okay. So you can find more info on on the main website, and I think it's pretty straightforward. Um, okay, and now the let's say an interesting part, which is yeah integrating with big data systems. So. Um, yeah, uh, first I should say like why would yeah why would you want to integrate Logstash with big data system, right? Because yeah, uh, Logstash and, and Elasticsearch is, I think it's quite okay. So um, in our case, it was because when we started using Logstash, I think the normal um, view would be like uh, try to monitor most the most logs that you can. So try to monitor all the data, all the logs and you end up with all this garbage which you cannot you cannot decode because you have so many logs and you can't just uh, look over all of them because it's too much so in the testing setup we ended up with 70 gigs per day and this was just too much so we were having too much data dns data in specifically and we decided okay so it's too much um, we can't process it using Elasticsearch because we would need too much hardware and it's just not okay. So we also uh, started to strip down data and only pick the stuff that we actually need and we actually care. So we ended up keeping the data only for one month and uh, only picking the data like... Um, stripping down all the information which is not useful for us. And yeah, that's it. And now we ended up with um, seven gigs per day. So seven gigs, I think it's quite manageable. And then we had the request of keeping some data for a large number of years, so like 10 years. So we, we have some trends, some DNS data, which uh, we have to look at 
uh, but over time. So how is it looking over 10 years to see what what's the trend? And we can't just, so we cannot do that in Logstash. And mainly because of the Elasticsearch storage, because that would get too much, too big, and it would be too, too needy, actually. Too much hardware would need to be pushed in order to achieve this. So we uh, started looking at Hadoop and Cassandra and tried to decide if uh, one of these two or both of them would be okay. Um, in our case, um, we started uh, using Hadoop and we were looking at this middleware uh, called, called Kairos DB, which is actually, um, so it's like an API which you can use in order to use storage either Hadoop, either Cassandra. So we were using Kairos DB, we were sending logs from uh, Logstash, we were sending logs from uh, custom scripts. It's quite simple, you just define this string of data, you define a metric name, uh, and a timestamp and information afterwards. Uh, yeah, and yeah, more specifically, like we for Logstash, we were using this open TSB output, and for scripts, we were connecting using uh, using a TCP port. So you can just send data over a TCP port, and you're okay. Uh, so we started using Hadoop first. Yeah, uh, we started to look at it because yeah, it's quite. I, th I think it's quite um, stable and so. And we were using the H base, so not using the whole stack called Hadoop. And um, we started to send data in it. We were graphing the data uh, using a tool called JSLate which is um, an interface which allows you to make these graphs using an API, an, a JavaScript API, and um, you just get the data. Then we were also playing with Cassandra. Uh, it was the same idea, uh, but using the, a different storage system. And uh, Cassandra, in our, in our view, it was uh, easier to maintain than HBase, and also we were having the same advantages. Um, and yeah, we were also using, we were also thinking of using Ceph as a storage uh, under Cassandra, but we dropped that because uh, using something other ca under Cassandra or under HBase would minimize the advantages that you have using this distributed storage. And we were also using, how I said at the beginning, we were using, uh, we were thinking of using Elasticsearch, because yeah, you have um, similar characteristics. You have advantages like uh, direct access from Logstash. You have that interface, API, and stuff. Um, but yeah, we dropped this because of the hardware requirements, which would be quite high over time. Um, and now, because I haven't added that slide, um, we ended up in doing our own API. So we um, we dropped the the Kairos DB, that middleware, because uh, it was restrictive in the um, in the power of structuring data. So we were limited to a specific structure, and um, that wasn't okay for us. So um, we started to do our own API in Perl, and to graph data, we are using the D3 library. It's a JavaScript engine, and you can graph data however you like. Um, yeah, this is mainly because of these uh, restrictions which weren't okay for us, because the idea of using big data systems were, um, we, we wanted a single point of storage for data for, for from different uh, types of systems, because we are having so many systems, like we have DNS uh, tracking system, we have database, we have log station now. So yeah, it was just um, too much for, for a team to manage. And we wanted to use yeah, this big data system in order to push all the data in. So 
Um, so yeah, so in our case, log stash was quite okay and uh, quite great. I think we 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 like it a lot because of its easiness to use, and especially of its power. Uh, like this um, searching uh, searching capabilities are quite nice, and the power of mangling logs in whatever way you like. I think this is quite interesting. And for us, at least, I think it's uh, it's something which is worth exploring also in the future. And we are trying to push more and more data to it and try to cover as much as possible data from our systems. Um, any question? Yeah, please. Yep. Yeah. And no, no, no. We are actually using Cassandra. Yeah, so we're still using Cassandra. So we're using Logstash for uh, tracking uh, logs from the from the machines, but we're keeping the data only for one month, and we're and we're using uh, Cassandra to get data which is needed to be kept over years. So, ten years, one year. F so yeah. Yeah. Yes, yes. So we actually use both systems because we couldn't just use Logstash in order to uh, yeah, cover all our needs. So yeah, that's why we ended up using these big data systems on one hand and the Logstash, which is yeah, perfect for our managing uh, tasks daily. Yeah. But so the big data system is not completed in yet because yeah we are still working on on the api and we're still working on the visualizing interface mm -hmm. it it actually is feeding both so it's feed so we're sending logs using logs to to elastic search and also sending uh, to our api so we're actually sent So we're we're keeping the data differently, but on the uh, on the big data systems, we're pushing data also from other sources, which are not sending to Logstash. So, yeah. So we're also pushing data from other sources, which which are not in Elasticsearch. Yeah. Please. Yeah, yeah. There. Uh, uh, we're not using so. Uh, from what I know, it's a connector. I think it's called a connector. Um, yeah, you can actually uh, write data, I think, from Elasticsearch to Hadoop as a storage. But um, we're not using it. Uh, we haven't invested too much time in researching it. So yeah, I'm not sure what are the advantages of it. To, yeah. So in our case, um, we try to minim to minimize the middleware stack, so we try to um, yeah go as slow as possible, and that's why by using Cassandra and using an API over, I think it's enough for us. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's 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 difficult. That's why we we can't use Logstash for um, visualizing data. Like even for one month, if you want to, if you have like seven gigs per day, and if you want to see it over one month, depends on yeah, how big is your index and how big is is your uh, message. And so uh, so it's. It usually, if you have uh, more data or large amounts of data, Logstash is slow. Well, not Logstash, it's actually Elasticsearch is, is slow because it's fetching all that data from the storage and it's trying to uh, render it in the user browser. So it actually tries to fetch the amount of gigs that you have and try to display it. So um, yeah, so if we have large amounts of data, we try to... Um, we try to flatten it, and uh, we try to lose all the data points, and we try to lose all the information which is not useful. That's why for our uh, big data system, if we display, for example, for 10 years data, 
we flatten all the graphs. And then uh, the idea would be to be able to zoom in. And once you zoom in, uh, activate data on the fly. So get more data from the server, uh, depending on the zoom level. And so if something was uh, unclear or so, um, just ask. Uh, thank you once again. Thank you for coming. Um, and yeah, if, um, if anyone has any type of question, um, maybe they can just send an email or so. Okay, thank you.